The World to Come. The Restored Church of God presents David C. Pack, answering life's greatest questions straight from the Bible and announcing the wonderful good news of the world to come. We pick up from last time on the subject of true conversion. Recall that part one closed discussing how Christians are running a race. Running takes effort. It is hard work. It involves expending a lot of energy. Watch people in a long-distance race as they near the finish line. They are tired, worn out, beat. Running is never easy, and sometimes, like a cross-country or marathon participant, the runner must go up and down hills over broken ground. The Apostle Paul said of himself, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. In the previous verse, he said that he had learned to forget those things which are behind and to reach forth to the ultimate goal before him. If a runner has pressed himself throughout a long race, he is totally spent at the end. Yet, if he gives up, he has no chance of winning, and all of his practice and effort in preparation for victory is wasted. So, no matter how tired the runner becomes, he remembers, with God, all things are possible. The Bible also speaks of Christianity as wrestling in Ephesians 6.12. Anyone who has wrestled knows it is very strenuous, often to the point of nausea and vomiting. Paul also compared God's way to fighting. Notice, fight the good fight of faith lay hold on eternal life, and for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, meaning physical, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The Greek means castles. Nothing about war is pleasant or easy. It is dangerous and usually results in casualties, some wounded, others killed. This is why Paul cautions war a good warfare. Jesus is called the captain of our salvation. The inexperienced or untrained soldier can easily become a casualty of war if he does not submit to authority and follow his captain's orders. Christians war on three different fronts. They must be vigilant, not neglecting potential danger from any of three enemies who daily confront them. It takes humility for one to acknowledge that any one of these adversaries is capable of overwhelming him. Let's briefly look. Ephesians 6 goes on to describe six pieces of armor used in spiritual warfare. It contains a strong warning not to forget that we are wrestling against, as it says, wicked spirits in high places. First, the devil and his fallen angels want to defeat and destroy every son of God in the making. If you are begotten of God, you are a son of God, carrying enormous potential for rulership. The devil hates the prospect that you can receive what he has never been offered, membership in God's family. He lies in wait like a lion seeking whom he may devour but he cannot defeat the vigilant and those who resist him. A Christian must continually beware of and resist Satan's attitudes creeping into his mind. Second, 1 John 5.19 states, The whole world lies in wickedness. This indicts all mankind. Yet there it is in your Bible. The Christian must also resist the pull of this world with all its glitter, excitement, attractiveness, and temptations. This is not God's world. The God of this world has fashioned it. The true God is not the author of the confusion, ignorance, and misery that permeate all cultures and societies of Satan's world. There are many temptations, traps, and pitfalls into which the true Christian can easily fall if he is not close to God and living by every word of the Bible. Paul instructed the Ephesian elders that God's Word is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance, meaning salvation, eternal life. Study God's Word daily. Third, 
Studying God's Word helps overcome the pulls of your flesh. Notice, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And they that are in the flesh cannot please God. A Christian is still made of flesh, but he is no longer in the flesh because he has God's Spirit leading him. Left unchecked, human nature consists of vanity, jealousy, lust, greed, envy, resentment, hatred, anger, pride, rebellion, foolishness, stubbornness, deceit, and hostility toward God. The one walking God's path is striving to curb and withhold himself wherever God's Word instructs. And he strives to exercise himself in all matters where God instructs. When God gives instruction to do something, he strives to do it. When God instructs not to do something, he strives not to do it. While learning to always follow this pattern takes a lifetime, building God's character is the purpose for which every human being was born. His job is to put on the character of God and Christ and to put off the fleshly pulls of human nature. Though this is not easy, the reward is awesome. Only through regular prayer, Bible study, meditation, and even occasional fasting, going without food and water for a period, will the child of God be able to overcome the three foes lying in wait for him every day of his life. God's Word is filled with stories of His greatest servants battling to overcome sin. In nearly every case, they had to learn difficult and sometimes very painful lessons. When examined collectively, Moses, Noah, David, Samuel, Peter, and many others are seen to have fought every kind of problem known to man. The Apostle Paul represents a classic example of how one of God's very greatest servants fought to overcome sin. At the end of his life, he was able to say he had fought the good fight and had run his course, knowing a crown awaited him. But this did not happen without much wrestling, pressing, running, fighting, and warring against his human nature. Romans 7, 14 to 23 educates and encourages that we are not alone in our path to overcoming Satan, society, and self, all of which lead to sin. It reads, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I, Paul speaking, am carnal, meaning physical, made of flesh, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. He continued, For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would do, I do not, but the evil which I would not do, that I do. It was as though whatever Paul did or did not want to do, his human nature, his flesh, caused him to do exactly the opposite. But why? God inspired him to record the answer for us. I find then a law that when I would try to do good, evil is present with me. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. Paul went on to add that only through the power of Christ's mind in him was he able to overcome and obtain final victory in keeping the law of God instead of obeying the very real law of sin. Only in this way could Paul later say he had fought the good fight and run his course to victory. Make no mistake, Christianity is all-out war but it is a war the Christian should expect to win as long as he continues to draw close to God to obtain strength for overcoming. God looks on the intent of the heart. It is overall desire and motivation that is important to Him. He wants to know if, after you sin, you are sorry and always determined to strive to do better. He understands the temptations that beset us even better than we do. He watches to see if we will be sober and vigilant as we root out sin from our lives and whether we will continually press on. 
the all-powerful God who made the heavens and the earth also made you. The physical universe was merely created to reflect the glory of God who made it and to be a beautiful gift for mankind to see and enjoy. You were created for an infinitely greater purpose, to become like God, to build perfect, holy, righteous character. God is actually reproducing Himself in human beings. Just as you are the child of parents and perhaps have your own children, God is your parent. As you physically look like your parents and your children look like you, He wants you to look like Him in spiritual character. Rarely anymore do people talk about or concern themselves with the development of character, once called virtue. It seems so few today understand much about it. Only through God's revealed Word is the right definition of character described and understood. Character is understanding, knowing right from wrong, and doing right instead of wrong. God reveals what is right, how to live. But righteous character is built through the power of free moral agency, deciding to do what is right. Like any muscle of the body, Character is built by pushing against resistance, thus strengthening the muscle, in this case the mind, undergoing the resistance. Character chooses to do what is right instead of choosing to do what is wrong. It does not concern itself with what others say or do, but only with what God says to do. God is love, and love is the fulfilling of the law. It is outgoing, outflowing concern for others, putting them first ahead of the interests of self. Constantly remind yourself that to build the very character of God is the reason you were born. Recall from part one that God's Spirit reflects a sound mind. Even on the human level, few people today any longer have much common sense. It seems harder than ever to remain balanced and stable as pressures and stresses surrounding people cause them to do more things that are unsound, strange, and even bizarre. God's Spirit will lead you into stable, steady, sound ways of thinking. It will help you see the things going on around you and react to them in a godly manner. It will settle your understanding and lead you to make wise, right, and sound decisions in your everyday life. Apply yourself. You must push yourself to grow and overcome. Do not expect it to be easy, like falling off a log. Grow in knowledge. Once converted, recognize you have been chosen to be a soldier, the Bible says, and must sometimes endure hardness. Breaking old habits will take time. After all, we have practiced and, in a sense, even refined and mastered them over a lifetime. Habits have become part of us. They are second nature. However, remember they are not the divine nature described in 2 Peter that enters with the receiving of God's Spirit at baptism and conversion. If you were an adult, it took you 15 to 20 years just to grow to a certain height. Christianity is no different. That's a long time, and it probably included many growing pains. You no doubt fell and skinned your knee or bloodied your nose many times before reaching adulthood. Christianity is no different. Do not become discouraged and quit growing any more than a child should get discouraged and quit life simply because he may have fallen or skinned a knee. When your child falls, you tell him to get up because it's part of life. Christianity is no different. Little children always want to grow up faster than life's timetable permits. Though childhood is wonderful in so many ways, most young people cannot wait for adulthood. Christianity is no different, but we have to wait. Full, mature Christian adulthood only comes after a long period of practicing the right way of life. We have established that all human beings sin. Should the newly begotten Christian expect this to continue after baptism? Is perfection achieved overnight by a certain profession of faith or by the acts of repentance and baptism? It is not. 
There is a lengthy passage of Scripture that is very helpful on the subject of forgiveness and related matters. Notice, and we'll read all the way through it. Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ, that your joy may be full. If we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word, the truth, is not in us. My little children, these things write I unto you, the Apostle John says, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and He is the propitiation for our sins. There is important instruction here. Open your Bible and examine it verse by verse. When you stumble and even fall down, remember David's words, the steps of a good man are ordered, meaning established, by the Lord. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Like a parent lifting or steadying a child, God regularly picks up and upholds his children. You can let this wonderful promise encourage you when you feel discouraged because you have fallen short in the Christian walk. Remember, the goal of a Christian is to become like Jesus Christ and the Father, to become perfect as God is perfect. What if a person dies before perfection has been achieved? Did such a person fail? Is one lost because he or she did not become completely perfect in this life? No human being will ever become absolutely perfect while still in the flesh. He should always continue to seek to be, strive to be, like Christ throughout his life. Perfection is a goal that carries with it a way of life that is to govern one's every thought, action, and word. God looks on the heart, the intention of a person who is yielded to Him. As long as he is spiritually growing and overcoming and led by the Holy Spirit, he remains a converted, begotten Son of God. Death changes nothing, since God is in charge of a Christian's life. Upon a Christian's death, he merely becomes asleep in Christ. He is awaiting the resurrection of all saints into the kingdom of God. So many worry that they may have committed the unpardonable sin. I have counseled scores of people who were racked with fear and anxiety because they were concerned or even sometimes felt certain that they were guilty of this unforgivable sin. After counseling, it was always clear they were not. But it often took much counsel and explanation to reassure them they had not committed it. I've often had to explain that the very act of being concerned is its own proof one has not gone far enough to be guilty of this sin. The unpardonable sin involves willful, deliberate, premeditated sin based on a clear and final decision to commit any kind of sin and to remain in it. The key, the core attitude is willful. Yes, many do sin willingly, but that is far different than willfully. Every time people sin, they are, of course, willing to do what they did. But they were usually overcome by some form of temptation or circumstance that allowed them to slip. They were soon very sorry for what they had done. Well, this does not ever lessen the seriousness of sin. If one is sorry about his actions and wants to change, wants to repent and be forgiven, and this is accompanied by the determination to do better next time, then he is far from the unpardonable sin. So do not give up. Do not quit. King Solomon wrote, If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. And for a just man falls seven times, the Hebrew actually means many, and rises up again. But the wicked shall fall into mischief. Do not ever draw back. Twice, Jesus said, 
But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. A Christian is not automatically saved at baptism and conversion. If you fall down, get up, seek God, repent, and go on. God will continue to uphold you if you continue to endure. Let's turn to a final parable that illustrates the Christian's responsibility to grow if he or she is to enter the kingdom of God. In Luke 19, 11 to 27, Jesus compared himself to a nobleman who went to a far country, a type of joining the Father in heaven for nearly 2,000 years until his return. The disciples believed the kingdom would appear immediately, and Christ wanted to illustrate that much time would pass before it did. The nobleman of the parable instructed his ten servants to increase the worth of a pound, money, that he gave to each for investment. The pound actually represented a kind of symbolic unit of basic spiritual worth or value. Remember that it was a parable, so Christ was not referring to any kind of literal money. He told his servants, Occupy till I come, or to grow the pound into more money. While the nobleman was gone, several of the servants said, We will not have this man to reign over us. It is vital to understand the intent of this statement. These citizens, as they're called, understood the nobleman, Christ, was coming to reign on earth. They wanted no part of this and rejected his government, his reign over them, and thus their future part in it. They understood that the kingdom of God would be a government ruling over the earth. Remember, the parable had begun with the nobleman going to heaven to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Upon his return, he called each servant into his presence to give an accounting of how each had increased the pound he had been given. Some had gained five pounds, others ten, and so forth. But one had buried his pound in the ground and produced nothing with it. Jesus wanted to know how much each man had gained, it says, while he had been away. The first servant had gained ten pounds. And Christ explained his reward by saying, You good servant, because you have been faithful in a very little, you have authority over ten cities. The servant who had gained five pounds was put over five cities. Because the second servant produced half as much, his reward was half as much. So these men were given authority. They were put into a position of rulership over cities. Their reward was to reign with Jesus in his world-ruling kingdom on earth. Read Jude 14. It is unmistakably plain. The servant who buried his pound in a napkin had wasted an incredible opportunity to qualify for rulership in the kingdom of God. And he, the nobleman, Jesus, said to him, Out of your own mouth will I judge you, you wicked servant. This servant had not grown. He had not produced anything with his life and had not qualified for rulership over cities in the kingdom of God. Christ gave the wicked servant's reward to the one who had gained ten pounds, so that the latter had even more than his own reward. The cities this man's neglect had caused him to lose would have to be ruled by someone. Otherwise, they would have no ruler with assigned authority over them. No one will be given rulership before he has proven he can be ruled. No one can be part of God's world-ruling government unless he has first learned to submit to the government of God and to be ruled by God and Jesus Christ in this life. This is the all-important lesson of the parable of the pounds. Now, what will you do? Will you grow, qualify, and develop in spiritual character? Gain more pounds than you started with? Will God get a return on His investment in you? Or will you bury your pound and with it your opportunity to rule in God's kingdom? Serious questions. To learn more, I urge you to read What is True Conversion? There are a few more years remaining to truly turn to God. Do not 
lose them. Until next time, this is David C. Pack saying goodbye, friends. This program was made available by Restored Church of God members and donors from around the globe. Explore our vast library of literature and other World to Come programs, which are all made available free of charge. To learn more or to find a local congregation, contact us to receive a personal response from a minister.